Good morning. Afternoon, actually. It's almost two o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're here in Kentucky in Covington. We're going to learn how to make maple syrup. Yes. Apparently, this is the, Hold on the week for maple syrup harvesting in this area. So, this is a first for me. We like to use genuine real maple syrup on our pancakes and such. I bake with it, so it'll be kind of fun to see how they actually do it. Yep. We shall see what we learn. What do you think? What do you think? Is it good? Yummy. Yeah? Sure. But it takes 40 of these, <laughs> the size water out of the trees, to make one of the syrup. That's a lot of water, isn't it? 40, 40 gallons of 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. That is crazy. I'm stealing the thunder, they'll tell you that. <laughs> no wonder it's so expensive at the grocery store. What do you think? It's different, but it's really, really good. It's got a, a smoky flavor to it. Kind of like if you were to burn the tree, you'd get that taste from being around the smoke. It's really good. Really different, but really good. Yeah, very good. You're going time traveling today. We're going back to the 1850s, which is way older than your great-great-grandpa. Way older. I do a bit of time traveling myself. Every once in a while, my phone will go off. <laughs> I'll have to check on things in 2019. But mostly, I spend my time in the woods in 1858. Now, thanks for braving the elements. It's, today is a much nicer day than it has been. We've had rain the last two days, and it, it wreaked a little havoc in sugar camp. Plus, it's so cold right now that the sap isn't running. Fortunately, we collected a bunch of sap water in advance, and uh, that's how you make maple syrup, from sap water. So I'll explain that all to you up in the Frontiersman's camp. So come on up here. Sap water is <clears throat> rainwater that's been, that's fallen on the ground everywhere, of course, and everywhere lately, <laughs> in a big way. And then it's filtered down through the leaf litter. Last year's green leaves turned brown, rain filters through them filters through the mulch and the ground and it's all the impurities are filtered out and the good stuff from the earth is filtered back in the roots of the trees are collecting sap water now a single tree might have a couple mm. miles of roots they don't go one direction a couple miles but all the roots from this tree add up to about a mile or so of roots well the roots are collecting the sap water and sending them up the trunk to the branches and eventually feeding the leaves. In the meantime, <laughs> we're going to borrow a little sap water from many of these trees. This had ice on it this morning. Here, let me. I'll just trade you. There you go. You give me your cup and I'll give you a, a cup with water in it. Huh? I can't hear you. You talking to me? No, there's a leftover. Oh, leftovers. Okay. Is that a leftover too? Yeah. Okay. Now, sap water has got many health benefits. Once you have water in your cup, back up so somebody else can get closer. And I can hand out sap water to everyone. It's only going to be slightly sweet because it takes 35 to 40 gallons of sap water to make a gallon of syrup. So this making of, sap, of maple syrup in the 1850s was very time consuming <clears throat> and labor intensive. It was hard to do. <clears throat> I mean, for one thing, you're out in the cold. Might be raining or snowing. Might not be dripping. The whole thing is kind of frustrating, but in 1850, you didn't have cane sugar yet. There were no bees. So, this was the only sweetener available. Maple sugar and maple syrup. So if you knew how to make it, you were a hot commodity in the community. In your community, I'm talking, your neighbor lives like a mile over that way, maybe a couple miles that way. You didn't live in little clusters unless you lived around the <clears> port. <throat> 
And if you lived around the fort, you, you knew all your neighbors, of course, and you traded not only information, but you traded goods. If you knew how to make maple, maple syrup, you could trade that maple syrup for a sack of flour, or some beans, or some coffee, or maybe a, some venison. Everybody get some? Mm -hmm. Well, if you sip it, that's one thing, but if you drink it in a couple of gulps, you get the full flavor of slightly sweet. Slightly sweet. And then you look around behind and make sure nobody's there and throw any more over your shoulder. <laughs> then, once you have tasted your slightly sweet sap, this maple syrup was made here two years ago. That's a clear glass bottle, but look how dark that is. That's from boiling down the sap water in a kettle over a wood fire. It's smoke infused. Okay, first of all, in America, there's an animal that wears these on his head. Um, elk? Smaller than an elk. Deer? It's a white tailed deer. There are some elk antlers over there, though. They're huge. This is a white tailed buck set of antlers. Now in Europe, they have deer too, but the male is called a what? Anybody know? Buck in Europe is called a stag. Well, this plant, once it's lost its leaves, and these branches are waving in the breeze, you had to put names to things, and they called this staghorn. It's staghorn sumac is what this is, and that's what we make our spile from and our spile is that little piece of wood sticking out of the tree that we get the sap water to run down and into our bucket if we just bored a hole into the tree there'd be a hole there and the sap would run down the side of the tree does us no good so you make a device that will get the the sap water from your tree into your bucket and to do that you make a spile to make your spile you have this handy tool. This is called a shaving horse. I ain't been using it much. <laughs> it's not that kind of shaving. <clears throat> but it is a tool and it's a it's actually called a oh it's a, you got kind of workshop at home. You got a vice in there. Not the bad habit kind, the other kind. <laughs> well a vice is a clamp and a shaving horse. Here I am riding my horse. Giddy up there, doggy. It has this part of it that is pulled forward by pushing your feet away from you. It's a vice. So what I'm going to do is clamp down my staghorn sumac into, well, under this part of it. And this is called a dumb head. <laughs> this thing right here is called a dumb head. <laughs> what I call my brother Elwood. <laughs> well, I'm going to pull the dumb head forward and use my crosscut saw <laughs> to cut off a piece of staghorn sumac to a more manageable length. A little straight piece like this. There we go. Okay. The reason we use staghorn sumac is because it's got a hard outside and a soft pithy core. Now, this is called a draw knife. You know, most knives have a handle and a blade. Not like this, but like this. Would you come around here and push on my back? My pants are slippery and, and I slide right off the back of this if I don't have some support on the back. I'm going to put the one end of my spile under the dumb head and hold it in place with my feet. And then I'm going to use my draw knife to shave off some of that outer bark and expose some of that pithy core. Which I'm doing right now. I don't really need somebody to push on my back. It just feels good. <laughs> I'm kidding. I do need that. Thank you. Now, I've exposed some of that soft pithy core. It's like cork in there. 
Then I use this device, it's called a pith pusher. And I push the pith out of my <laughs> spile. Okay, so you're cleaning that out. And then you give it the old eye test. Well, I'm looking for a maple tree. If the leaves were on and they were green, they would look pretty much like this. They'd look exactly like this one, they'd be green. A maple leaf has five points. One, two, three, four, five. That one's kind of a spare part of that one. Five points. And if you look in your flag book, you see the Canadian national flag has a maple leaf on it. That's their national symbol. Like we got the bald eagle, they got a maple leaf. Well, I found it right here. So it would be safe to assume that one of these two trees is a maple tree, right? Maybe. What if it just got on the breeze and flew in here from like a mile away and just landed here and I thought, okay, this must be a maple tree. Well, I know this is a maple tree, but I know it by its bark. Mom? The maple tree has this odd thing it does. It stands up in places on its edge like that. Like, like the back of a dinosaur or a bluegill, you know, it's got that spiny mm -hmm. back. Here's some, like that right there. Yes. This is a maple tree. Hard to tell in the winter when the leaves aren't on there. You know when you're running really fast and you wipe out and you skin your knee and you're bleeding all over and you think you're going to cut your leg off? It's just horrible. It looks really bad and it's really not. But when you get it all cleaned up and they put a little polysporin on there and a band-aid, about two weeks later the scab falls off and you're healed. Looks like you never even hurt yourself. You know how that happens? Mm -hmm. Well, the tree is the same way. When we bore a hole into it and then put the spile in and get our sap water out and then take the spile out, about a month later, you can barely tell that tree has been used for maple syrup making. It heals itself from the inside, just like you do. Who's got the drill? When you're running, do you like to run up, hill, or downhill? Downhill. Downhill is easier, isn't it? Much easier. Well, water likes to run downhill too. So to get our sap water to run out of the tree, we're going to put our hole in at an upward angle. Then the sap water can run down our spile and into our bucket. Now I'll tell you right now, we're not going to see any sap running because it's too cold. Ideally, when it gets below freezing at night, the night before and then the next day it gets up to about 40 degrees the sap will start running it got cold last night but it never got warm so we're going to put a hole in the tree this tool i'm using is called the brace and this is the drill bit part of it and you just have to drill your hole into the tree about two or three inches what's coming out now is the cadmium that's the, the bark of the inside of the tree You just pour your entrance hole out a little bit bigger and then back your drill out, put it back in, clean out the hole a little. Before that go in, it's not very far, I don't think. Okay, who's got the nail? Well, we're going to get out our pocket knife. Now, when you kids were about eight or nine years old back in the, in the 1800s, your parents would have bought you a pocket knife. This ain't no toy. This is a tool, a very important tool. And you would have taken very good care of it and never lost it. Or done dumb things like throwing it and trying to stick it in the other tree. But you would have used it. You boys would have maybe sharpened a stick and gone down to the pond and maybe gig some frogs for dinner or made a fishing pole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Or frog legs. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, maybe you made a fishing pole or an arrow for your bow. And you girls might have used this for some sewing project you were working on or maybe made yourself a doll out of wood because you couldn't go to the store over in Cincinnati 
20 miles, you got to walk. And you didn't have any money. Back then, if you had a dollar, you were a rich person. A dollar. You got a penny? Well, you're richer than me. I got no penny. So what I'm doing right now is using my pocket knife to shave down the end that I'm going to put into the tree. I want to make the end smaller so that when the sap is running, when I tap this in, the fat part of my spile is stopped up and then the sap water can only run through the hole and down the spout and drip into my bucket. Now I'm going to tap this into the tree using my persuader. Now you always want to put your knife away, just clean it up a little, and then throw it on the ground and walk away. Fold it back up, stick it back in your little holster device, close it up, and then you always know where your knife is, and you can find it when you're looking for it. I want you to listen real closely, because <coughs> when I'm tapping, you're going to hear a soft sound and a hard sound. The soft sounds when I'm tapping it in, the hard sounds when it's in the right length, the right distance into the tree, and it's made a tight seal. So listen up. Pretty hard there. If the sap was running, it'd be dripping out there and you could get a drink from the tree right now. But the sap's not running, it's too cold. So maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. Maple sap production is kind of a, a hit and miss. If the weather's right, sap is running, you're a happy camper. And you're collecting a lot of sap water. And it takes a lot of sap water, 35 to 40 gallons to make a gallon of syrup. If it's not running, I hope you got something else to do. <laughs> because you'll be waiting for the sap to be running. Maybe you're doing a little house repair or you're fishing or hunting or trapping. Maybe you're making some pies. But what we'd be hoping to hear right now is this. That'd be the sound of water dripping in my bucket. And we've had it when we've got 70 or 70 buckets out here and we're working for a couple of weeks where at night there's no wind and that's what you hear all over the place. Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> Pretty cool. Plus, overnight, this would be filled up. Two gallons of sap water overnight. Wow. And the sap's running good. So when you got 70 buckets, that's 140 gallons of sap water at a time. You know, you, then the real work begins. You got to carry it from way back there all the way up here. In this camp, we make maple syrup because we have jars with lids that we can make airtight uh, and can the syrup. Over there, in the 1750s, uh, they didn't have that technology yet. So the only way to preserve food was to dry it out um, using either uh, heat, smoke, um, or salt. And this kettle's boiling away here. Kentucky's known for uh, salt boiling um, and maple as well. To make maple syrup, it takes, I guess you already heard this, 35 to 40 gallons of sap to make a gallon of syrup. When you change that syrup into sugar, it takes one gal or one gallon of syrup will make about five pounds of sugar. Wow. So it takes a lot of work just to make granulated sugar. But the natives would uh, boil the sap down to make syrup, and then they would make sort of a, uh, a hard candy by pouring it over snow uh, or. Today we would just crush up some ice. If we had some snow today, it would be great. We have the right temperatures. Just all the moisture went by the past couple of days.